So I, I don't know if you heard the, the news story. It was about a year ago. It was an amusement park in Texas where this roller coaster clicked its way all the way to the top and just before it went down, it got stuck. Like it was locked right there at the peak of this, of this hill. And there's a picture. I got a picture for you. I don't know if you remember seeing that or not. Um, I don't know if you have that fear. Like those of you that don't want to ride roller coasters, like, like that is your fear. That used to be, used to be mine. That, that we're going to get to the worst possible place, the highest point on the ride. And then it's just going to stop and we're going to get stuck. And that's what happened to these people. They were in this position, by the way, for 45 minutes. Now, that's a long time. Like, like, didn't sound like a long time. But when you're up there, 45 minutes is a long time. And they're hanging on with this white-knuckled grip, not knowing what's going to happen next. Are they going to go back from where they came? Or are they going to make it over and go down in front? Or are they going to go over the edge and get stuck again? Or are they going to fall out? What, like, what are they going to do? They had no control whatsoever over their situation for 45 minutes. I don't know about you, but I, I kind of think that this is a little bit of a picture of how a lot of people in our country and in our world are feeling about life right now. Like we're tense, we're uptight, we're stressed out, we're worked up, we're worried, we're, we're anxious. We are on edge because there's so many unknowns. Not sure how long this will last. Uh, we're not, we're not uh, sure uh, what's going to happen. We're on edge because our lives have been disrupted. Our work has been disrupted. School has been disrupted. Things that we look forward to this time of year have not happened. We look at the, the stock market. All of these things, by the way, oh, I, I don't know if you saw this or not. Um, this, is, this is true. Uh, those of you that are basketball fans, last night, the NCAA basketball committee met and they decided, you know what, we've got to have we've got to have a basketball champion this year. Like we can't, can't not have a champion. So we're going we're gonna to just choose one. And so they decided late last night, you, you probably haven't seen it, they decided late last night that the last team to win a game in the NCAA is going to be the champion. So, so Indiana University, they were the last team to win a game. So they are at least, in, at least, yeah. At least in my and Mark's mind, they are the champions, all right? So, but you know, we often have this illusion that we are in control of everything. Um, and really in our lifetimes, probably in most of our lives, t- lifetimes, this is really only something that we have questioned maybe a couple times. Like, like really question that we have, uh, have no control over what is going on. Now I want to propose to you this morning that that, that it can be a good thing. And that this feeling that we, we might have of just like not being in control, not knowing what's going on, that this can be a good thing. To bump up right against the hard reality of the fact that we are not ultimately in control. Because when we realize that, when we realize that, that we are not ultimately in control, no matter how much we might kid ourselves, when we realize that, then we can really... Seek the one who is in ultimate control. The one who does have everything under his control. And so a lot of people today are feeling overwhelmed and stressed out, easily irritated. You know that if you've been to a store in the last few days. Um, And we want to talk about that this next couple of weeks. Now as a culture, this is a pretty appropriate subject for us, even aside from uh, the thing that's going on now. Even before all of this happened, we live in anxious times. And you look at some of the symptoms of anxiety that doctors and mental health professionals and others tell us that that there are some obvious things that we'd recognize right away that mark a lot of people today. There's nervousness and fear and irritability and sleeplessness and just this general sense of feeling overwhelmed. There are a lot of other symptoms of anxiety. It can overwhelm our emotions. It can alter the levels in, a, in, a, in our brains of serotonin and dopamine. And, and it can cause us to have disturbing and obsessive thoughts. It can cause agitation and anger and annoyance. It can make you feel moody and lonely and sad and depressed. And, and it has a, an abundance of physical symptoms as well. But anxiety can can really do us in. The the U.S. Center for Disease Control said that about half the deaths that take place before the age of 65 are related to stressful lifestyles. Harvard Business Review says that anywhere from 60 to 90 percent of medical visits are stress-related. Stress-related. A guy named Dr. Lee, he wrote a book about this, and he concludes, we live in an age of anxiety. We have become a nation of nervous wrecks. 
Now, that's like even in good times, right? So, so right now, many of us aren't doing too good. Maybe you're not doing too good. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're watching and you're just like, no, nah, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. Um, I want us to look at this topic and this time that we live in uh, this week and next week and from a couple of different angles. Now, next week, I'm going to be talking, uh, going to be preaching from Philippians chapter 4, which tells us to, to not be anxious. Today, I want to look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, and, and we got to get the context of, of Peter's writing this. And so, uh, Peter, the Apostle Peter, he's writing this letter to Christians. He addresses them uh, just as these Christians in chapter 1 as those who, quote, are scattered, those who have been scattered. In other words, these are kind of refugees. These are Christians who have, because of suffering, because of persecution, they've had to leave their families, they've had to uproot their lives, they've had to leave their friends. Every, everything, that, everything that they know, they've left behind. And their lives have been flipped, turned upside down because of their faith. They laid, laid it all on the line for Jesus. Now that's the situation of the people that Peter is writing to. So Peter says in chapter 5 of 1 Peter, he says, now humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And then he says this, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. But then he follows it with this odd sort of turn. He says, but be alert and of sober mind because your enemy, the, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. You're like, like, I think something got left out there. Like he missed a transition or something. How does he go from cast all your anxiety on him to, oh, by the way, there's this thing prowling around that's trying to kill you. Well, he knows that that's really kind of how oftentimes the enemy does try to devour us with anxiety and, and fear and trying to get us to turn on one another. And so Peter says to resist that. In verse 9, he says, resist him. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Like, I don't know about you, but it, like, doesn't it make you anxious sometimes to think, well, I'm the, I'm the only one that's, that's going through this. I'm the only one that feels like this. I'm the only one who struggles with this. And, and it's good to know that there are others who, who understand what we're going through. And Peter says, like, you're not the only ones. You're not the only ones dealing with this. You're not the only ones going through this. There are others who have been, listen, there are others who have been through what you're going through and, and really even much worse. You're not alone in this. I think we got to, I think we got to keep that in mind that, you know, we our, our lives have been disrupted as Americans, but we've got to keep in mind that this thing is, is all over the world. And not only that, but there are people, there are people all over the world, in fact, in most of the world, for most of history, who have had to deal with things like that we are dealing with on a much more massive scale. And not just for a period of time. Like, like they'll, they'll get this figured out. It will, it will end. But there are people, brothers and sisters, that we have around the world that this is their daily life. Not having enough. Not, not, not being able to go to the stores and not only do they see empty shelves, but they don't have stores. And we got to remember that. We got to remember that. I, I was uh, throwing a fit the other day. I know this is surprising to you, but um, I, have, I have this thing. Like I, I have a thing about ice. Um, I don't know what it is, but our ice maker at our house broke. And for whatever reason, I just have a thing about ice. I love ice makers. I never had one uh, actually until we moved here. And I thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. We have an ice maker. And, and, and it broke a couple weeks ago. I'm like, how, how, will, I, how will I live? <laughs> I'd, heard, I, like, I'd heard about these things that you put water in and you put in your freezer and it makes ice. But I was getting ready to kind of get to the bottom of this, either buy a new one or buy a new refrigerator. I don't know what I was doing. I was out of my mind, all right? And then I remembered something. I remembered um, a bunch of us were on a mission trip in Jamaica about 10, 11 years ago. And, and the pastor there of this church that we were working with, he said, hey, Pastor Chris, I want you to run and get some ice with me. Like we were going to give the kids ice cream that night. And so I said, okay, whatever. And so he has these, these two beat up old coolers. He, we throw them into his car. And I thought, we're just going to drive to the, like the corner store, get a few bags of ice. 
we drove for an hour and a half, which is, is, is absolutely horrifying um, to ride with somebody uh, in Jamaica. Um, but but we go for an hour and a half, and I thought finally we come to the store. No, it's not a store. We go into this kind of shed-looking thing, and there's a guy in there, and the guy says, come on in. And so we take our coolers, and we go in this structure, and there's this big block of ice and so literally for an hour, we're chipping ice off of this big block of ice into our coolers. And it's melting while we're doing this because it's 100 degrees, right? And, um, and, but we get some ice, we go back, we drive an hour and a half back. And I thought, you know what? Like, maybe I can deal with my ice maker problem. I think that I, think that I will be okay. We are just so, so unaware of how the rest of the world lives. And... Like, like Peter says, you know, regarding, regarding what they were going through, you're not the only one. All the brothers and sisters are dealing with this. And so, so then he says in verse 10, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will, rest, will himself self restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. He says that day is coming. Like it, it's going to come. Then he says to him be power forever and ever. Amen. So that's kind of the context, but going back to verse 7, when he says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's a, that's a great verse. I love that verse. You've probably heard that verse. Problem is, it can be kind of, kind of cliche, like a, like a really easy thing for pastors or for anybody to say to somebody who's really struggling with anxiety, okay, cast your cares upon him. Um, and, and it does kind of feel sort of cliche and feels a little bit simplistic, a little idealistic, maybe a little bit naive. But what if, like what if it's true? What if, what if it's true? What if that last part is really true where he says, cast all your anxiety on him, on God, because he cares for you? Well, if he does really care for me, if that, if that is true, that he really cares for you, if he really cares for me, then it's not a simplistic thing. It's not idealistic. It's not naive. It's just like it's just the truth. And so then the question then becomes, do I, do I, really, do I really believe this? Do I really believe what Scripture says that God really does care about me, that God can be trusted that God will take my anxiety. That's really the question. Do I, do I really believe that God cares, that God can be trusted? And maybe this is where, maybe this is where you're stuck, maybe on the top of that roller coaster hill. Maybe you just can't get over that. You, you, you want to cast your cares on anxiety on God, but it's hard for you to do. It's hard for you to believe that he does care for you. Maybe it's not this current thing we're going through. Maybe it's something that's already happened to you. Maybe it's something that happened years ago, but you, because of that, find it very hard to really cast your cares on him. And if that is the case, then I want you to understand that Peter, who wrote this, Peter understands that. Peter knows what it's like. Let me remind you, in Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, Peter and the disciples, you probably recall this uh, story, P Peter and the disciples get in this boat. It's Jesus' idea for them to get in this boat. Jesus says, hey, let's, let's get in this boat, go over to the other side of the lake. And so, so they're in the process of doing that, but in so doing, this huge storm comes up. In fact, it's so intense, it, it's a furious squall, it says, it's so intense the waves are crashing over the sides of the boat. And these disciples, many of whom are experienced fishermen, like they, they just panic. They're overwhelmed with fear. And in their anxiety, they start looking, looking for Jesus. Well, where's, where's, where's Jesus at? Then somebody remembers that he said something a while ago about, about being tired and going to go take a nap. And, and so they go to the stern of the ship, and that's where they find him. He's sleeping there on a cushion. They go down there, and in their fear, they shake him Awake, And here's what Peter and the disciples say to Jesus. Don't you care? Lord, don't, don't you care if we drowned? And so Peter, the one who would later say, cast all your cares upon God because he cares for you. Here he is saying, Jesus, don't, don't, like, don't, you, don't you care about us? Don't you care if we drown? Because it, it doesn't seem like you do because, like, first of all, you wouldn't have had us to get in this boat in the first place. But you certainly wouldn't, like, you wouldn't be asleep. 
And we kind of can have our own version of that. Jesus, if you really, if you really cared for me, then like whatever, fill in the blank, whatever it might be. This happened or that didn't happen or, or whatever it might be. Fill in the blank. Because it, sometimes Jesus doesn't really feel like you do. If you did, why, why would we be in the middle of this storm? And so, and so here's, here's the thing I, I want us to understand is that we just automatically, intuitively, because like we've kind of been programmed this way as Americans, we, we intuitively tie our circumstances to our anxiety. And we think that the way to peace, freedom from anxiety, comes only with the change in our situation. Like, like, like if X, Y, Z would happen, then, then I won't be anxious. And yet what we're going to see even, even more next week as we go uh, through Philippians chapter 4 is that the peace of God is not dependent. In fact, it's quite independent from our circumstances. So it's Jesus saying, hey, if you're going to have trouble, the storms are going to come. But in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the trouble, you can have peace it's a peace that can't be fully explained. It passes understanding, but it's a very real peace. See, we want to we want to say, well, look, I don't I don't want to be nervous. I don't want I don't want to be nervous, Jesus. So, like, if I could get a better job, if I could go on a nicer vacation, if my husband were more attentive, if my wife was more encouraging, if my my mother in law was more absent, if my child was more respectful, if my boss was more reasonable, if the stock market didn't take a nosedive, if if we could get a handle on this pandemic, if if only Lord Jesus, if only we could find some toilet paper, then <laughs> then I. I would find peace because the conditions would be different. But this isn't what Peter teaches. I'm glad he doesn't. Peter's writing to people who are experiencing extreme pressure, tribulation, anxiety, persecution. And he doesn't promise them that, that part of following God means that God is going to change things immediately. You get that passage, it says, like in due time, in due time, in, in a little while, not, not immediately, and so he tells them in the midst of this to cast their anxiety on God. So I looked at that word cast, I'm like what, is, like, what does that mean? And immediately my mind goes to, like Peter was a fisherman, right? So I have in my mind a, a fisherman casting, you know, like casting out into the, into the sea, right? Uh, not, a, not a good image, because what happens when you do that then? Like, like me, you don't catch anything, and then what do you do? You reel it back in, right? So I'm looking, I'm looking at scripture to get a little more insight into this. And this word that's used in the Greek for cast is only used one other time in scripture. And there it's translated as transfer. Transfer. Like you, you transfer your weight. That's the idea here. That we're carrying some weight. We're carrying some pressure. We're carrying some anxiety, some fears, whatever it might be. And maybe it's not even... Like maybe it's not even a heavy thing that you're carrying, but, you've, but man, you've been bearing that load for quite a while and it's holding on to you and you're holding on to it. The world's approach to anxiety will tell you, just let it go. Just let go of it. Just kind of set that free. But you know better than that. You know that it, you just can't let it go because if you let it go, it's, it's, it's all going to fall apart. So that's not what Jesus says, I don't think. That's not what Peter says. Jesus says, hey, you don't, you, don't have to like let, you don't have to let go of that. It's still going to be there, maybe. But he said, why don't you just transfer that over to me? You've been, you've been carrying this weight for a long, long time. Why don't you just transfer that over to me? Why don't you cast, why don't you cast that to me? Because I care for you. Peter is going to talk about how we do that. Um, and again, we're going to talk more about this next week. But a big piece is, 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 is connected uh, in verse 6, rather, when he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may, he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him but because he cares for you. And so Peter here connects, he connects pride with anxiety. We oftentimes think of pride and anxiety as two different things, but they go together. In fact, in the, in the New International Version of the Bible, it actually puts these things as two different sentences. If you look in your Bible, they're two sentences, but it's really not. In, in the Greek text, it's really only one sentence. 
So that actually verse 7 is a subordinate clause to verse 6. And so what Peter is really saying, he's saying, humble yourselves, casting all your anxieties on God. This, this is how you humble yourself. By you casting it on him. That's how, that's how you do it. The way you humble yourself is you cast your anxieties on God. But we have this thing called pride. Pride makes me anxious by, by making me self-centered, by making me self-conscious. Sometimes we hear this word pride and we think this idea of arrogance, that I'm, like I'm better than other people. But biblically, pride is just kind of this over-centering on yourself, that we put ourselves in the middle of everything. The more self-centered I am, the more concerned I am about my pleasure, about my desires, about my comfort, my suffering, the more I focus on those things, the more anxious I become. I think this is a, I think this is a big part, if I'm honest, uh, of, of the reason a lot of us may be feeling the way we do. Again, we've just become, as a society, so addicted to ourselves. So addicted to our comfort, our desires, our pleasures, being able to get whatever we want, when we want it, right now. And so when these things are threatened, even in, in the grand scale of things, even in the most minuscule way, like we realize that we're not in control that there are things that are beyond our ability to manage and that even the governments of the world and medicine and all the smartest people are even having, kind, of, kind of having a hard time figuring this thing out. Now, I want you to listen to me here on this because this needs to be said. Some of you will disagree with it and that's okay. But there are a lot of things when, when stuff like this happens, there are a lot of things that you hear from the Christian community. And, um, and, and when things like this happen, whether it was in the 1980s with the AIDS scare or 9-11 or the 1987 stock market crash or any, any number of things, school shootings, violence, whatever it might be, whenever there are things that come up, there are always some Christian people who are on TV talking about, well, this is, this is the, the end of the world, that, that this is God's judgment on, on all this stuff, and this is the end of the world. And, 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 and listen, scripturally, we've been in the end of the world. These are the end times since Jesus was here. We're certainly getting closer, like we're not getting farther from it, right? But to say, well, this is surely the end, end times. This is happening because God is judging this group of people for that or this group of people for that. That is just irresponsible. And it's not called for in Scripture. And quite honestly, it makes the church, it makes Christians look unloving, foolish. But most of all, makes us look proud. Makes us look prideful. Like, like maybe, maybe this or maybe all the other stuff that happens. Maybe, maybe it is God's judgment I don't think it is, but maybe it is. But I wonder, who is it the judgment on? See, we think as Christians, well, certainly it's all those people out there. So what I'm saying to you simply is let's not get crazy as God's people and start ascribing blame to, to different people for this, that, and the other thing. It just makes us look bad. It reflects badly on the Lord. And it's just not something that anywhere in Scripture we are told to do, to make, to make pronouncements against whoever or whatever because of the things that are happening. Now, what it should do, however, in such times like this, as believers, it ought to humble us. Again, it ought to remind us that we are not in control. It ought to reveal to us like how hopelessly addicted we are to our way of life, as if it's a right, as if we are owed to have the kind of life that we are used to. When again, so much of the world for all of history has not lived like we live. And yet when it's threatened, we get so, so afraid. It causes anxiety. It causes anxiety. But transfer that. Transfer that to God. God, as a father, he wants to carry that weight for us. He wants to help us toward freedom. He wants us, as, as Jesus said, to live life abundantly like not abundantly like we often think of it, but, but a life of peace. But it requires humbling ourselves and asking for help. And so, so sometimes when we feel anxious, maybe it's now, maybe whatever, sometimes we just need to humble ourselves and just admit, I, like, I need help. I need, I need to go talk to somebody. I need, I need some help because I am kind of falling apart at the seams. And yet the pride part of us wants to say, no, no, you can do it. You can handle it. Uh, never, 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 lead, never let them see you sweat. 
Pride makes us selfish. And Peter says the antidote to that is humbling ourselves before God's mighty hand. Another word for that, humbling ourselves before God's mighty hand, I think it could be kind of summed up in the word worship. The word, the word worship comes from the old English word worthship. And so when we worship, all we are doing is we're ascribing to God the worth that is due him. We're acknowledging that we are small, he is big. That we are not in control, that he is in control. That, that is really what, what worship should be all about. And worship and worry, as we'll see next week, have a really, really hard time, um, have a really, really hard time going together um, and cohabiting and coexisting. One tends to drive the other out. So I want to just kind of a a couple of things as I wrap this up real quickly. Um, These things that we're going through now or the things down the road that you might go through, we might go through as a country, Peter says, like, don't be surprised at these things, you know, the, the world, the world is not a perfect place. And so he even tells them that in chapter four, one chapter back in first Peter, he says, now, dear friends, don't be surprised. Don't be taken by surprise at the fiery trials that you're, that you're having to deal with as if, as if these are strange, as if nobody ever told you that you're going to have hard times because pretty sure that Jesus told you that when he was alive. Like he says, so don't, don't be surprised. Just expect that, that things are going to come up that are going to drive us to that strong tower of God's name. And that is, that is not a bad thing. And understand that no matter how your life is going or not going, however you think it should be or not be, that God is still in control. Peter says, look, this is, this is part of life in this world. And so don't, don't get caught off guard when we experience some of this. And then the other thing I would say to you is what he says is it's going to be temporary. Like it's going to be temporary. And here's, here's the problem with that. Uh, and maybe you experienced, I wasn't here in this town at this time. But uh, I remember the church I was at when 9-11 occurred, um, and, and really throughout the country, man, churches were packed. You, people could not get in church fast enough, and people were again saying, this is going to be the, the beginning of a, of a nationwide revival, and, and everybody's going to come to Jesus, and it's going to be an awesome thing. And it was, like for a couple weeks, then life goes back to normal and we forget, they clean up the mess, life goes back to normal, unless you were directly affected by that, then it never went back to normal. But the problem is that it is temporary. And so our, our challenge will be like, are we, are we finally going to realize what is most important in life? Times like this have a way of helping us discern what is really important and what is not important. And I'm going to tell you, as we've been talking about the last few weeks in that series on technology, um, that um, a lot of what we occupy ourselves with is really not important. So it's going to be temporary. The roller coaster is going to finally make its way down the hill. What are we going to do then? Are we just going to be like, oh, thank goodness the, the, the shelves are stocked again and people aren't killing each other for a roll of toilet paper or whatever? Or are we going to say, you know what, let's, let's like remember and let's let this reflect in our lives, not just for a couple weeks or a couple months, but let's remember that God's in charge. You know, in the, in the Bible and in the ancient world, bodies of water, I don't know if you knew this or not, but bodies of water, like seas, rivers, whatever it might be, were associated with bad things and with evil things. In fact, you look in the book of Revelation, it talks about how the dragon stood on the shore of the sea and the beast came out of the sea and there was a a great prostitute who stood by many waters. But then you read a little further in Revelation and it talks about how the river was calm as glass. And then by the end of Revelation, it says there's no longer any sea. You see, water represents evil. And, and Revelation is saying that, that Jesus Christ finally has decisively defeated evil and the sea, the symbolic thing of evil. And so there, there's no longer any sea needed. And so with that, I want you to think again about this episode from Mark. The disciples are in the boat. They're in the storm. Jesus, he's down catching some Z's. The storm was fierce. The waves were breaking over the boat. The wind was howling. This evil sea was about to devour them. 
Like that's what they would have thought. That, that is what would have been going through their mind. Like Leviathan, the sea monster, is going to destroy them. That is what they were thinking very literally. And so they go down to Jesus because they realize they don't have any power. And Jesus got them into this mess. So let's go wake him up. And then they say again, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care? Peter Peter says, stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers through the world is undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And so they go to Jesus and Jesus, they say, don't you care? Now it's a question, again, that, that we all ask ourselves at one time or another, whether it's a storm in the sea or a storm in your soul. So what does Jesus do? He gets up and it says that he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. And this is important. It says it was calm, completely calm. This thing, this this symbol of evil and chaos, this thing that was about to destroy them and sink them was as nothing to Jesus because he was the Lord over the wind and the waves. And I love the disciples' response. They're like, well, who is this? Like, don't you want to just say, like, duh? Like, you've been, you've been with this guy for three years. Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Oh, well, he's, he must be the Lord. And so Jesus called for the disciples to have faith as he reminded them who he is. That he is the Lord over all of creation. He is the Lord over the wind and the waves. He's the Lord over life and death. He's the the Lord over viruses and anxiety and evil and sin. And the question, does he care for you? Yes, he does. And he can be trusted. He can be trusted. I, I just want to say that the best way to really, really get that, the, really, the best way to understand that, that, that Jesus does care and that, and that Jesus can be trusted, the only way that we can really get that through our minds is if we're in the middle of a storm and we call upon him. And he comes to us oftentimes like walking right on the thing that we're afraid of and he says, peace be still. Or maybe the only way that we can really get that through our minds is if once in a while, once in a while, we're stuck at the top of a roller coaster and we are forced to admit that we are not in control, but he is.